Well, good morning, friends. I'd love to talk with you all about love for just a few minutes. And I can't talk about love without talking about my babies. It is one thing to say that you love God, but the path to God goes right through humanity. One of the things that I know in this day and age, maybe even more than ever, is that lots and lots of people talk about their faith and how religious they are. But if you want to show me that you love God, show me what you're doing for God's children. Mm -hmm. And it starts with our babies. I've been fortunate to travel to around 40 different countries around the world, and I know that there's lots of things that we are not going to agree on. We may not agree on some political things, we may not agree on some economic things, but the one thing that I know in my bones to be true is that everywhere that I have gone, people love their babies. And they want the same thing for their babies as I do. They want food in their belly, they want a roof over their head, and they want dignity in their soul. And I used to know that up here until my baby Roya was born. And I thought I knew a thing or two about love. I had spent a couple of decades of my life reading books of love poetry and love mysticism. And then I held her in my arms. And when she opened up those eyes and she looked at me, something happened. And something keeps happening every time that she looks at me. Um, tonight is her prom. <laughs> and I am going to leave y'all <laughs> to go have a dance with my baby, because she still wants to dance with her baba. Right. Um, I thought I loved my mama, and I do, and I thought I loved my baba, and I do. But when I held my daughter, my heart got bigger. I didn't love my mom less. I didn't love my dad less. The capacity to love grew, right? That's what scripture means when it says, Alam nashrah laka sadrak, didn't we open up your heart for you? There is a love that opens you up. And then when my son, Amir, was born, he's now taller than me, he's got a beard, but he's still my little boy. And when I held him, I didn't love my daughter any less. The heart got bigger to encompass him. And then when my daughter Layla was born, when I met my beloved Corina, the heart keeps getting bigger. That's one of the teachings of the path of love. That love compels you to grow beyond what we've seen as the limit of ourself we start to see love not as some emotion, right? As I sometimes joke with people, love is not an emoji, <laughs> right? Love is not something you text people. And love is not even something that you feel. Love is actually the very unleashing of God onto this realm. It is the very being of the divine. And at some point, we come to see that it's this love that brought us here. It's this love that sustains us here. And if we merge with it, the same love will carry us back home. Right? This is the path of love that all of our traditions teach using different stories and different symbols. One of the things that I want to do is just to share a couple of teachings that have touched my heart, and I hope that they will also touch yours. 
So in our tradition, the Sufi context, they encourage you to think about how does your love lead you to serve people? If you love somebody, you serve somebody. And this was very real when I think about my own babies, right? Yes, they're cute and cuddly. They don't always smell good. And then they wake up in the middle of the night every four hours and they cry. When people talk about you sleep like a baby, that's what they mean. You wake up crying every four hours. <laughs> and you get woken up, and in that moment, you're faced with a choice. You're tired, you're sleepy, you have not had eight hours of sleep for decades. <laughs> but your baby is crying, and at that moment, you don't sit there with a pro and con list. You don't rationalize. There is no intellect involved anymore. Your baby's crying, and love compels you to get out of bed and go pick up your child and hold her against you and comfort her. There is a love that transcends reason, and there's a love that even transcends choice. You've just surrendered to this love. Right? That's when you know that this love is washing you of your ego, of your selfish quality. And so the teachers of this path, and we're blessed to have two of them from two beautiful traditions on stage with us, they encourage us to think about, as the great song used to say, how deep is your love and how wide is your love. How wide is your circle of compassion? You gotta love yourself. If you loathe yourself, you're probably gonna loathe other people too. If you loathe the color of your skin, the texture of your hair, the shape of your nose, or in my case, the lovely round way that God made me, <laughs> you're probably gonna hate a few other people who resemble you too. But if the circle of your compassion only extends to yourself, well, congratulations, you're a narcissist, <laughs> right? If love compels you to project yourself beyond yourself, and you love your baby, you love your mama, you love your baba, but you say, oh, you know, I'll love but I'm only gonna love my family and nobody else. Okay, congratulations. You've transcended narcissism and you're stuck at nepotism. <laughs> then sometimes love compels you a little more and you say, okay, I'm willing to love everybody that looks like me I'll go beyond the family. Look, everybody, congratulations, you're a racist. <laughs> Clap for yourself, you know? Love compels you to grow and say, you know what? America. Love everybody who lives inside these imaginary lines. Congratulations, you're a bigoted nationalist. <laughs> you say, I will love everybody who bows down and prays to God or goddesses the same way as I do. Hmm. You're a religious bigot. What if love compels you and to say, one God, one humanity, and that the same one God who loves who creates, who feeds, who nurtures, who redeems, and who calls us home, compels us to swim in this cosmic current of love with absolutely no exceptions. That we love 
for every sentient being. Every blade of grass, every tree, every flower, every human being, born and unborn, past and future. That's a love that's like sunshine. That's a love that's divine. And that's a love that we're called to participate in. The teachings of our traditions also tell us that this love is divine. The prophet Muhammad has a beautiful saying in which he encourages us to think about the ways that God introduces herself, himself, to us. We're told that God has a hundred names, a hundred qualities. One of them is hidden. There's always something that's hidden, right? The Tao that can be spoken is not the eternal Tao. In the Jewish tradition, we've even forgotten the real vowels and how to pronounce the name of God. The Holy Grail has to be lost, so we go searching for it, right? And in Islam, we're told that there's a name of God that's hidden, but the other names we're told about. And when you start studying the Quran, the beginning of every chapter, except one, starts with these same two divine qualities, Rahman and Rahim. Rahman and Rahim, the infinitely merciful, the especially tender. The infinitely merciful, expansive and wide, and the laser beam focus of loving tenderness. God has a hundred qualities, a hundred names, and think about all the different qualities that you and I have, right? I am a son, a partner, a father, a student, a friend, a teacher, a neighbor. I have a name that my mama gave me. And what would it be like if when I meet you and you're like, tell me something about yourself? And I keep telling you the same two things. I am Roya's Baba, Roya's Daddy. And I am Ali and Puran's son. And then I meet somebody else. Tell me something about yourself. I am Roya's Daddy. And I am Ali and Puran's son. If I do that a hundred times over and over again, you'd be like, yeah, I guess these are two things that are really important to him. And of those hundred qualities of God, the all-knowing, the all-just, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the manifest and the hidden, the two qualities that God wants to introduce himself herself by, the infinitely merciful, the lovingly, specially tender, you would think these are important qualities for understanding God. Arabic, just like Hebrew, sacred language, which operates on a root system. If you want to know the meaning of a word, you got to go into the roots. It's like a tree. You got to dig a little deeper. And the roots of a word are what gives you the heart meaning, the essence meaning. I remember when I was trying to teach my son about Rahman and Rahim, and these words compassionate and merciful didn't mean anything to him. They're like, and he was almost said sarcastically, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, <laughs> eye roll included. And then I remember that teaching from the prophet that said, these two qualities of God, the Rahman and the Rahim, come from the word rahim, which means a womb. A womb. So think about this. We are told in our faith tradition that the divine transcends gender. God is no more he 
then God is she. And there are masculine qualities and feminine qualities. But so many of the names that we use come from the masculine side. God the king, God the ruler. In some languages, not in Islam, God the father. People have no problem, our heavenly father. And then if you pray in the name of our heavenly mother, they have a conniption. <laughs> They're like, why are you projecting gender onto the divine? I'm like, you've been praying in the name of God the father for centuries, <laughs> right? Well, that's separate. The prophet says, and later mystics like Ibn Arabi say, these divine qualities of Rahman and Rahim, the compassionate and the especially tender, come from the root of a womb. And then they add, it is as if, ka'anna, it is as if we are contained inside the womb of the Divine Mother. It is as if you and I and the whole cosmos is contained inside God's womb, the ultimate maternal symbol. Where I want to end and introduce the conversation with our friends is this. So much of the time when we pray to the divine, we look up as if we are praying to a God who is up there and out there. The feminine aspect of God allows us to change our prayer. There is no divine that is out there, outside of us. We are praying from the inside. We are already inside the divine womb. And in the same way that a mother loves, nurtures, cherishes, and provides for an unborn baby, that is how intimately we are sustained by a divine mother. Without this feminine dimension of the divine, we have half a religion. Let us have a whole faith. If we strive to be whole human beings, let's have a faith that is whole. Then may it be that the circle of love, the circle of compassion, encompasses all of us even as we are already inside God's womb. With your permission, we'll now turn it over to our two wonderful teachers that we have, Jamal Nurhoja and Rinpoche. Bismillah. <laughs> If we may begin um, with you, could you share with us a little bit about the teachings of compassion and wellness mm -hmm. that have defined the path that you've been teaching? Mm -hmm. I've been teaching almost close to 30 years. And uh, of course, I teach compassion and insight of the Buddhist tradition. But lately, I find out that without the core connection within ourselves, even the compassion, wonderful, amazing, even the cognitive base, insight, mindfulness, everything great, but somehow, we feel in deep down there's some form of hollow. And as you mentioned, we all have 
this great love. But sometimes, due to the circumstances and lifestyle, so we forgot the basic essence of love, I call the basic fundamental okayness within ourself. You may call, you know, love yourself, or I think I will call like, just feel the birthright connection, the readiness to give love first, love, and ready to receive love. So this very beautiful, open, and like spontaneous, humorous, in the body, in the feeling, not in the mind only. So I think this is, I think we, we must connect that. We have that, I call birthright, but the life where we live and uh, so many things, there's very much chance that you go disconnect from that and go into your head and trying to find all the solution from the head. So that I see is a little bit uh, a danger hmm. and uh, it makes you hollow, uh, hungry. Sometimes I call this, that hollow is called hungry ghost. Some kind of like. So I think for my work right now, to the, the hyper mind come back to your body and within the body, you find feelings, and maybe there's different kind of feeling, healthy feeling or distorted feeling, and make friend with them, and make it transform by itself, and then go back to the, the, the child heart, the open, one more time, and nurture that with the care, with the, some training, and then make that fundamental very strong, and then, Essence love start to express, you know, uh, called expressional love, loving kindness and compassion, and it makes you uh, a romantic love very healthy, parenting love also healthy, and that essence love also express to compassionate love and devotional love. So I think I'm really focusing on the, the root of this healthy okay feeling is called unconditional love hmm. without subject and object. And from there, we train to have expiration love could be healthy. Hmm. Without that, even if we train love, there's somewhere deep down, there's some hollow. So I don't know. Yes. <laughs> this is how I, <laughs> I want to have everyone have that okayness in the in the mind, in the feeling, in the body, of course, in the mind. And once you have that, then everything, I think, could be very beautiful. Amen. Without that, you know, everything is sort of consuming to that hollow to feel okay by something. But the by something might not have full potential make you okay. I call, of, of course, External okayness is, I call, bonus, extra happiness. But we must have the basic fundamental okayness. And then extra external happiness is, is can be plus. But only external with that hollow and speedy in your system and griping only for outside and finding the solution. I think that is it's not so good for environment, hmm. not so good for your health, not so good for your heart. Sorry, not so good for your heart. And so when you um, speak of the danger of a hyper focus mm -hmm. on the mind, right. um, is this something that you experience as a universal condition, or do you find that? for folks living in the modern world, perhaps even more emphatically mm. in the Western world. In the, in the high class world. High class world. 
And this doesn't sound like such a happy world, uh, this high-class world. Is, uh, I mean, you know, hoping for a happy world. <clears throat> but the more you hope, if you lost this connection, I'm not sure you will end up happy world or not. But with this okayness, somewhere grounded, I call grounded body, open heart and open mind. If you have that, wow, you know, the speedy world is, external speedy world is beautiful. But without that, you might have so many things, but in deep down, there's a hollow. Hollow, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> my English is not so good, so, so I didn't bring my translator. I have a two translator here, but <laughs> so save the time. I just came by myself. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> And, and you speak of... So, uh, sorry, I call this disconnected hollow in the advanced country, I call high-class suffering. <laughs> high-class suffering. I think you might like it. <laughs> we have a high-class suffering. Wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And you speak of this original wholeness original happiness Hol oh. as, a, as a birthright. Right, as love. As love. And so essence love, I call. The essence love. I, love, I make essence love and express expression. But we express a lot, but we are missing the essence. Sorry, just yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, And so, as you understand our human condition, um, our essential condition, our what in the Sufi tradition we would call our primordial nature, our fitra, that essential nature of us is to actually be whole, to be happy? Happy, but it's a different kind of happy. Happy without reason. Hmm. That happy. Just, just happy. If you ask why you're happy, I don't know. <laughs> but mine always asks, when body start to feel okay in, in, the, in the feeling, in the heart, and the mind start to feel, why are you okay? <laughs> and the heart says, I don't know. <laughs> Tell me, what reason are you happy? <laughs> I don't know, I just feel happy. <laughs> so we're missing that. We want to be happy with something. And then it goes here, and something, subject and object, and condition. Hmm. So unconditional well-being, okayness, is less and less, and okay with something, happy with something, which is wonderful, but we have to have that. And then the speed in it will come down a little bit. The speed is not physical speedy, physical speed. Mind speed, wonderful. Physical speed, wonderful. But there is an anxious kind of between, I call subtle body, speedy, between mind and the physical body, there's another area called subtle body. And the, the modern lifestyle is very hard on that. Hmm. I have very funny example. Uh, yes. You have time, all the time. Really? <laughs> <laughs> this is an illusion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I like to respect the illusion. Yes. A Buddhist point of view, although it's empty, but there's a relative truth. So I like to respect. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, you know, one time I had this speediness inside of me in London Heathrow Airport. So I was in lounge. In the Buddhist uh, business lounge, you have a restroom individually, like 10 of them, and line was, there were line. So I was waiting there. Somebody, I want to get in to the restroom. I don't know why. I feel like zzzz, inside like an engine without going anywhere. <laughs> so, and my, my turn came. So I was watching who is coming out. I want to go in. So wait, 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 wait. Nobody coming out. Suddenly I heard one flash noise. So I went to that door and the door opened and I went in before the person coming out. 
<laughs> you know, so that it was a British gentleman. <laughs> Says like, sir, let me come out first. <laughs> <laughs> then I saw, wow, what happened, you know? So I look at that, the, 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 the speediness in the subtle body also. It's Tibetan, we call lung. I think Sanskrit is called prana. I think Chinese is called chi. Mm. It's not in balance. It's moving very like that. So he, of course, he come out. I went in and I sit there. Wow, what happened? Mm. I look at my watch. I have three more hours to go. <laughs> but you know, it's not rational. It's not a you know. Mm. But the message from the speedy says you must get in, do something fast right now, fly. But I cannot. I have to respect the physical speed. Hmm. Physical speed, I have through three more hours. But it's not a mind, it's not a physical, it's something in the... More subtle. Subtle. And that is very hard. Hmm. I think we've got a lot of uh, burnout, disconnect from our, our well-being, our okayness. And I, I teach a lot about how to come down and relax but not necessarily physically slow down. Mind thinking very fast, physically very fast, but this unnecessary, distorted, restless come down. And that gives you some kind of room for essence love to grow. Let me ask you um, one last question before we turn over to oh, Jamal Noor. Good. Uh, <laughs> the last one, I'm waiting for that. <laughs> Say it. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. May, may all souls and all bodies be, be safe and be whole. Um, I would love to learn a little bit from you about the work that you have been doing with the nuns. Right. And uh, what has led you to, or to feel called uh, to that particular training mm. and what opportunities and challenges? Mm. The, well. Basically, uh, I have a natural connection with the women's education in Tibet also. And now I'm living in Nepal. And uh, there's a, sometimes we call karmic connection at the first. And then I see the uh, greatness, the potential of the, the women. Like if if we if they train well, they can do great things. And uh, I'm sort of preserving the wisdom tradition of ancients and bringing into the modern, in the female form. Hmm. So this is what I'm doing. And there's a lot of challenges, of course, uh, society challenge a little bit. And the place there where I'm in Nepal, you know, people are very warm-hearted but a little bit slow, <laughs> more than we need. Here, we are, we are faster, more than we need. So I'm trying, <laughs> trying to balance that is very tough. So I have a, a director coming from Europe and quite punctual, strong, good heart, and train all the teachers and bringing European. Becoming European, <laughs> mine, like, because in Nepal, very warm, they say, they'll come two o'clock, but they'll come three o'clock. <laughs> when they come three o'clock, they come with a happily, without any guilt. <laughs> <laughs> Which is wonderful, what I can do? They're so kind, they're so happy, and they even don't bring the guilt of not coming one hour later, <laughs> but still happy. So I have to respect that, no? Hmm. <laughs> Lovely. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Happiness, no guilt, balance of punctuality and ease. Okay, yes. I think there's lots of great yeah. lessons. This is also yeah. one of my, can you hear me? One of my sort of trying to bring the open, kind of free spirit, 
sorry, warm heart connect with the essence, essence love, and then when they express love and respect the relative, external with the punctuality. Yes. As a free, I call simple insight, complex outside, and between the complexity and simplicity, how to bring together. Yeah. The punctuality makes everything sufficient. Too tight here makes everything miserable. So happy, without reason open, but everything respect and right in time. Right in time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and oh, thank striving you. for <laughs> <laughs> striving for being on time. Let me see. Where is Sarah? Did he... Would this be a good time for a little stretch? Yeah? All right, let's get up and uh, stretch for about a minute or so, and then we'll turn to Jamal Noor. Just get up and stretch your arms and legs. And... All right, friends, if your souls are happy, if their bodies are happy, and if the subtle bodies are happy, then uh, let's be seated. And now we have the great pleasure of continuing our conversation with uh, Sheikha Jamal Noor Hojam uh, from Istanbul. I know many of us had the great joy of listening to you this morning. Other friends might be joining us um, freshly, and we've got our friends who are joining us online. Um, Hojam, I would love to begin with a discussion uh, about unity, unity, which in um, uh, Arabic and Persian would call tawhid, in, uh, in Turkish tevhid. Um, and this is a concept that sometimes people narrowly define as the oneness of the divine, but you've always talked about this as something more holistic as simply that notion of, of unity in general. We would love to learn with you, you about that. I try to speak English, but Omid translate me from English to English. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> and uh, we Turks uh, try to show the unit or tevhid like this. You see my fingers come together and we show the beauty like this. We never speak, but if it is something beautiful, we'll, we do it like this. You see the five fingers is not looks each other. But if they accept each other, that be beautiful. Hmm. This is David. Yani, we, our problem is we never accept the other ideas. But Allah has many names, and all names behave not the same. So if we accept the other peoples, we accept the Allah at the same time, and then. Uh, we look the religions, they try to say the same thing. We look the people with love, they try to say the same thing. But uh, it's uh, hard to understand because they, their behaviors is not look like each other. So if they not look like me, I don't like it. I said, <laughs> no, I don't like it. This is not tevhid. Tevhid means accept everybody, ideas, Although all kind of people, because of Allah, because there is no other uh, Allah in the world, only Allah, and all names belongs to Allah. Because of this, we must accept all of them. Hmm. Maybe you translate me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you really see this. Uh, lack of accepting of one another, which is really a lack of 
detecting the presence of God in one another as one of the core causes of tension yes. in this world. Yes, it begins with the love, you know, the world begins with the love. And uh, according to Hafid Muhammad, he said, Allah wants to know. But I don't understand what I, Allah needs, why Allah needs to, uh, to know. I don't understand this. And I looked at the Mesnevi, Mevlana. Mevlana said, never want. But uh, the beauty of Allah come out. Hmm. Uh, flow, 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 overflow. 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 And the names uh, come the word. And the names wants to Allah, please give us a wujud being, being, existence. Then we want, we want to come to you again. This is what we want from Allah. But then many kind of names comes to this world. Many kind of soul, many kind of name. Then. We accept uh, all the way what will happen to us because we want to go to Allah very quickly. We accept pain, suffer. We accept our family. We accept our children. We accept our illness. But when we come to this world, we said, I don't want it. I don't understand this idea. We accept before all these things. So. All these things on the way we needed. Suffer, uh, pain, pain. Uh, children, uh, which uh, give, uh, suffer more than Allah. <laughs> <laughs> because we really love our children, that what you say. But we, at the end, we learned that we mustn't uh, tapmak. Uh, adore? Adore them, but only love them. Uh, and uh, we accept our husbands or wife, uh, although they give us a very big pain. <laughs> <laughs> but but when at the end, when everything finished, when we uh, come to understand everything, we pray for, for all of them. Thanks you because we ne I need you to uh, go to Allah on the way, I need you. And once, uh, when somebody speak about me very badly, I asked Mesnevi, why? Because I did nothing to her. Why she didn't love me? And the me it, Mesnevi, it says, we wash the uh, bad things, wash clothes, uh, but uh, for, you wash it during the wash, you will make it wet. But at first it's dry. And you make it wet, and after dry again. And Mevlana says, why you do all these things? Because it's dry and come to dry again. And he gives the answer, because you can't clean it. If you, everybody says you are very beautiful, you do it very well, how can you clean it? So the people uh, have a job in this world to clean us. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be very happy when I heard this and I fall in love with that woman. Thanks to that woman. Because he clean, she cleaned me. I might need to sit with that one for a little bit. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, mashallah, yeah. And I've heard you give this advice to people by which I mean she gave it to me yesterday. Um, <laughs> this is not hypothetical, people. This is this body here. Um, that for husband, wife, for friends, that one of the sources of our suffering is that we look to each other too much. Yes. And yes. instead, we should be looking towards God. Yes. Uh, in Quran, uh, it says to, for the woman and the uh, husband, uh, zevj and zevje. 
Zevch and I look the uh, what zevch means and zevch means, and I learned that this is two shoes. The two pairs of shoes. Two short pairs of shoes, zevch and zevch. They not look each other, but if they if you lose one of them, you can't go. Then uh, wife and husband never look each other. Then only they say how bad she is or how bad he is. But if they come together and go to Allah together and study very hard for the ideas, 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 ideas uh, and never looked any other places, never interested with the people what they said, you'll be very happy in this world. Thank you. Yes. This is what I try to do. I have no husband, but what I try to do. <laughs> You know, when I think about what both of you are saying, um, whether it's the essential love and express love. Not essential, essence love. Essence love and express love, or this notion of love as a kind of washing, mm. as a kind of polishing. One of the things that occurs to me is that, particularly, I think, in the Western world, or the high-class world, technological world, we reduce the idea of love only to romantic love and a specific kind of physical, even perhaps sexual love. And it seems to me that both of you are really speaking about love in this very wide sense. It could be the love that one shares with a friend. It could be a love that you share with your spiritual community. It could be the love that you share with parents, with a neighbor, with a stranger, um, as long as they serve as a kind of mirror to you yeah. to continue your spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there's really so much beauty in that understanding because I think when I listen and hear this whole week we've been probing the idea that we don't want to just have talking sessions, we want to have listening sessions mm. where we receive each other's wisdom and each other's experiences. It seems to me like one of the real sources of suffering is that people have not found that romantic partner or they found and it was not as they expected it or they found and they lost it. But it seems like both of you are saying that what matters is to live in love and not to reduce it only to that romantic variety, which is, I think, a really amazing insight. Uh, if you want to a uh, murshid in Turkey, uh, murshid first ask you. A spiritual guide, a spiritual uh, teacher. Uh, do you have a lover in your life? And uh, you said, if, no, I never. And murshid said, go, go. You behave, you live like an animal. But if you have lover, then you will understand what I speak. So we need love. We need the paint of love. Pain. Because in every um, love, uh, romantic love, there is a paint. But we need it because we uh, actually is overcome, overcome with uh, this love to Allah. If you say that, there, like Hazrat Shams uh, said this, uh, one man came to Hazrat Shams Mevlana's teacher and showed the uh, moon in the water. Look, Shams, how beautiful it is. And Shams smacked, uh, smacked. smacked his, uh, that man, said, uh, moon is there. Hmm? Why are you interested with it? Mm. And we must love, but not stay there. Hmm. We must uh, try to find the real moon. I, this hmm. is the important part. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, Hojam, if I may, I wanted to also ask you about another question that returns us to what's been one of the themes for this whole week, which is the notion of the feminine. Mm -hmm. um, you teach classes on the Quran, you teach classes on 
Rumi's great masterpiece, the Masnavi, and you also teach classes on the amazing uh, Andalusian mystic, Ibn Arabi. Uh, Ibn Arabi cites a saying of the prophet, Muhammad, um, that in which he quotes the prophet saying, from this world of yours, I was made to love three things. Perfume, yes. women, but that which brings coolness to my eyes, which is an Arabic expression meaning the thing that refreshes my soul, is prayer. Pray. Yeah. Prayer. And Ibn Arabi spends a lot of time discussing perfume is a symbol for the whole natural world, the sensual world. Women are the linchpin, the center, the hub of the wheel. And prayer is what brings delight to the heart. I would love to hear you. I don't understand Ibn Arabi. I'm not smart enough to understand <laughs> Ibn Arabi. Um, could you help us understand in this feminine understanding, why are women in the middle of that hadith? Yes, it's very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, woman, uh, when men need to look to women to know themselves. You said before, they are, we are mirror to each other. So uh, if you love a woman, then you begin to love yourself, what he said. But not yourself, your ego. You fall in love, uh, Allah, in you. Then uh, you can see yourself on the woman. Because Mevlana says in Mesnevi, it's very, very interesting. Woman, woman is like a... Not uh, creator, created, created, but woman is the creator. Ah, oh, yeah, right. Yes. So there's a line in Rumi's poetry in which Rumi says, when you speak of women, do not call women created beings. Women are life givers. Women are creators, and they share in that same divine quality of God. So really call woman a divine life-giving, creative force. And the woman uh, is the beauty of Allah. Wow. Mevlana said like this. Mm -hmm. and my, my teacher said the same thing. So if you behave woman good, that means you are kamil, insan kamil, the perfect human beings. But if you behave you badly to the woman... Kamil, uh, insan kamil, a mature human being, a fully realized human being. But if, if you behave very badly to the woman, then that means you are animal, not a man. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but not I mean all the dishy. Uh, female? Six, female. I mean real woman. Hmm. Real woman is like a heaven, uh, prophet says. What he uh, why is he said this? Because heaven has dirt uh, for uh, Nihir. Rivers. rivers. Heaven has four rivers. One is water, one is uh, bal, uh, honey. honey, one is wine, and one is uh, milk. And uh, first, I uh, don't like wine, <laughs> milk, and only water. And I said, maybe I don't want to go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end, I learned that water is humbleness. Oh. Milk is ill, knowledge oh. of Allah. And the honey means tevhid. Unity. Tevhid. You accept everybody. And the wine means fall in love Allah. If a woman uh, have all these things, woman more beautiful, uh, I'm sorry, but more beautiful uh, to the man. Inshallah. Inshallah. That, uh, I don't mean the woman or man. That I mean the nefs and uh, akl, uh, intellect. Nefs means woman, intellect means uh, a man. But uh, you know, you must know that only nefs tekamül edebiliyor in the vücutta. Mm -hmm. Increase. Can can only nefs increase in the body. Mm -hmm. We need that nefs. Mm -hmm. Ego is the first part. But when it 
go up and up, it will be Maria, Hazreti Mary. So it's, we begin at the level of an ego self and undergo a process of spiritual completion and maturation, almost like a ev spiritual evolution. Uh, and then you arrive at the state of completion and perfection that's symbolized by um, Virgin Mary, uh, who, of course, is um, the, honored, the, the, the purified and chosen um, station, <laughs> the loftiest uh, it, place. It writes in Quran. In the Quran itself, yeah. Wonderful. Well, um, I think learning lessons from our teachers as we go, that uh, time is not just an illusion, but something that we also have to honor. Um, I think with uh, your permission, um, we may take a little break. Is yes. our, uh, we have the wonderful um, opportunity now to sustain our bodies, hearts, and souls through words and stories and teaching, through silence, and also through music. Uh, and music which in, uh, in uh, the Sufi tradition is described as the sound of the movement of heavenly spheres. Right, so movement is not banging on a drum and playing strings, it's an echo of the original state that we uh, originate from. So we've got a wonderful uh, opportunity to hear from Annie Daigle. Is Annie here? Yes, yes wonderful. Um, Annie is a violinist uh, from the Louisville Orchestra, and she is a fellow, and she's a mighty good fellow, um, <laughs> from the, I've always wanted to make that joke, always, <laughs> always wanted to make that joke, uh, from the New World Symphony, and um, for those of you, those of us who love Louisville, uh, she follows Teddy Abrams to Louisville uh, from the New World Symphony. So we have the wonderful occasion to benefit from the sound of the movement of the heavens at the hands of Annie.
Oh, me? Yeah. Um, I was asked by Rinpoche to just do a brief introduction to the video. Um, this is a work that was made by a man named Richard Heckler, who just completed this uh, video portrait of the specific uh, world of Rinpoche's work with, with um, young women and, um, and nuns in Nepal. And I think the section we're going to see does not touch into the Tibet piece. It's just a six-minute excerpt but it will give you a flavor and a taste of uh, the world that Rinpoche is working in in Kathmandu. Um, so without further ado, uh, uh, Richard Heckler's beautiful piece. In a developing nation like Nepal, beset by centuries of poverty, it is the vulnerable who suffer most. And while the consequences to everyone in need are great, the consequences for young girls are dire. Chobar Hill rises from the Kathmandu Valley, a refuge from the density and squalor of the city. Legend says that Manjushri an emanation of the Buddha symbolizing wisdom, cut through the land with one chop of his sword to allow the Bagmati River to flow from the ancient lake, creating fertility in the valley. Over the past six years, one man, Soni Rinpoche III, has quietly purchased land on this hill to build a school for girls, a school that makes a unique offer if any girl can make her way to the campus on Chobar Hill, she is provided, free of any tuition or expense, nine years of Western education with nationally certified teachers, intensive study in the Buddha Dharma, free room and board, and free health care. Any girl is welcome. Anyone can leave whenever they wish. We are 10, mom, dad, and eight children. We have five daughters and three boys here. Five of us stayed with parents, working a little bit in the fields, and doing the household chores, but I didn't go to school. Since I'm the eldest daughter, I had to help my mom with all the house chores. That's yeah. what elder daughter does. It never ends. More and more, all the time, it's more and more that you have to help. And that was my life. Each girl is given the robes of a young Buddhist novice, an honor in Nepali culture. But there's more here than meets the eye. For in Nepal, these robes also confer some degree of protection from exploitation, child marriage, and unending servitude. It's not foolproof, for long-standing prejudices are slow in dissolving, but it helps to ensure their safety while they study and grow. The school is an ambitious project, not only for its brick and mortar, but for its vision. That vision didn't begin with Sony Rinpoche III, but over 150 years before. The Sony lineage is started by first Sony Rinpoche, and first Sony Rinpoche saw the needs of women's development. At that time, it's the best is Buddhist education and practice. In the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, Reincarnation refers not only to the continuation of consciousness from lifetime to lifetime, but sometimes to a karmic responsibility handed down as well. some 
great potential after a few years of training them. And then he asked many of his male students to establish nunnery. And then he, every year he go there and teach. That devotion was assumed by his young Si, or reincarnation, Soni Rinpoche II, and continued into the mid-1900s until his tragic and untimely death. Second one, every year you go one round with all the nunnery. Spend five, 10, 20 days, one month sometimes, and teach, and also do some time group practice puja together. And then this culture revolution happened when second Sonia died on the way to prison. The third and present Sony Rinpoche was barely nine years old when told of his karmic responsibility by his father. One day, a letter came from Nanshin and Adi Rinpoche. They asked me to come. In that letter, there's a big request from Kechak nuns. Please come to visit us. So then Tukuji Rinpoche told me a brief history of connection with First Sony, second Sony. Tugu Jirumaji himself stayed many years in both nunneries at Kechak and Dechinling, both are Sony nunneries. Rinpoche, as his students call him, became increasingly aware of a piece of his own life's narrative, a piece that had already been written. With the help of contributions from the world over, the school began to take shape. Still at the beginning, neither he nor anyone else could foresee what would happen. Major Rinpoche and myself, we went to Nuri, my hometown, and I saw many children are not joining a local school. So I gave a speech there, please join school. It's very important. And then I said, in case if you don't want to join your school in Nuri, so you can come to Java and join Nuri. That time I thought about seven, eight, and then suddenly karma happened. Tradition offered an easy route. The girls could enter the nunnery. This had been done for generations, and they would be more than happy with that. Rinpoche took his direction, however, from a more personal source. I have a small monster myself. I never went to school. So every time I speak English language or some other modern stuff I like to learn, it's very difficult. I have a choice. I can do like a normal nunnery or establish separate school for the young nuns. So I choose that part because my monster and their need. This one is happy with the reason. <laughs> what would you like to share with our friends here about the Buddhist teachings that these young girls are receiving? Mm. They came to the nunnery at uh, different age, some five, six, seven, or some little older. So first thing, they joined school, um, about nine years. And then they have a choice. They can leave if they want, or they can stay. If they stay, another nine years of Buddhist philosophy all the, the texts from India, Indian texts, which is translated in, in Tibetan, from Nalinda tradition in Nagarjuna, Chantikirti, all the solid root texts about mind and also Buddhist psychology, meditation. So it's very 
they debate. Whatever monks are doing, yeah. they're also doing that. So after that finished nine years, if they didn't go, if they still stay, then next is they go for three years uh, retreat with the retreat master in one nice house. We already built that. Uh, and then they go there and they do yoga and a lot of subtle body practice. And they do a natural mind, and which is finding original space, which is the host of all the relative phenomena. It's calm and peace. And we talk about essence love is one of the, the reality of our natural mind. Another natural mind is to go beyond fixation, beyond reify fixation on subject and object, there's a luminous state of mind, which as a Buddhist we call Buddha nature. If you're not a Buddhist, you can call nature of mind or nature of reality. And to connect with that and then the nurture, the essence of love into loving kindness. There's a lot of practice how to, uh, you know, bring into fullness of loving kindness through mindfulness practice and through tonglen, you know, giving and taking. So you understand other people's suffering and you take people's suffering on you mentally, you feel, and whatever your joys, love, compassion, merit, you extend to other people to give, share. And then from that, you, you know, which is called bodhicitta, means bodhisattvas, full love and compassion practitioner is called bodhisattva before Buddha. <clears throat> so we trained that for three years uh, without studying so much because study is already done. It's more like practicing. And then after that, I'm hoping there can be a, you know, I call small or mini Dalai Lama <laughs> going around in the female form and teach or can go back to their village and they can do both. They have everything. I never went to a normal school. So my school, I went to India, is all about, based about Buddhism. Isn't, you know, not so much about uh, the modern things. Of course, the ancient wisdom is there, but not the modern wisdom. So I like to have an ancient and modern wisdom together and I think it will complete I call it human being should have both so this is sort of my mission and I'm working very hard on that this is my main project and I really see is important for the world and I think this is a small factor of world peace work I'm doing also I hope one day it can be a ripple, ripple effect. Mm -hmm. Ripple effect, let's go. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure about my English. My English is not so good in the United States. My English is improved a lot in Taiwan. <laughs> Even Taiwanese, they're surprised my English. <clears throat> But in the UK, in the United States, no hope. <laughs> but I still have essence love, so I'm quite okay. <laughs> it's okay. I had, uh, I had learned English, and then we moved to North Carolina. <laughs> and then I discovered that uh, there's a whole other tongue that's oh. spoken there called Southern. And the English that I had learned was of very little use. <laughs> so I had to become bilingual. And uh -huh. so now I can switch back and forth <laughs> between, uh, between English and, and Southern as, as needed. Um, so, uh, Hojam, I would love to turn to you. Um, I know that when people come to see you and to see... Uh, the organization that has been around for many decades, 
uh, Turkish Women's Cultural Association, uh, Turket. Uh, this is probably new to some of you, but uh, familiar to, to many of you. Um, both Tibetan society and Turkish society have undergone some very drastic transformations in the last hundred years. Um, in some cases because of invasion, in other cases because of um, um, secularization and modernization. And so there was a time that Sufi organizations uh, disappeared, mystical organizations, brotherhoods and sisterhoods disappeared from the public and they sort of went underground and in their place you had NGOs essentially emerging with names like Turkish Women's Cultural Association, Society for the Preservation of Turkish Literature, Society for the Preservation of Turkish Music, and you go and there's mystical chanting and there's mystical literature and there's mystical practice, but in the function of an, of an NGO. And I know when people come to you, particularly from the United States, the first thing that they often comment on is, wow, look, a mystical community led by a charismatic female teacher, where the majority of the participants are these highly accomplished, professional, cosmopolitan women. And you keep saying that this is not important. Um, do you really mean that? Yes. Is it? Yes. Yes, because I have uh, some job. Uh, I must do my job. I must reach my Allah in my sight. And after, uh, I must help the people and uh, show myself, but not, I never said to my students, I, I hate to say students because I am the student at the same time. Uh, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. I try to show how uh, I behave. First, uh, they behave all bad things. <laughs> then uh, they begin to understand that we are very happy. And I, oh, what I uh, find in the world, I am really happy. Re you know me. And then uh, they try to um, be like us and uh, get, come and ask what you eat, what you drink, what, how you do at night, what, how can you pray Allah. Uh, I, I tell them, if, but don't be too much like me because I am very thin, I can't eat anything. Not be, be like me, but uh, you must kismek uh, azaltmak. Reduce? Reduce your eating. You must reduce your drinking. You must reduce your uh, everything. Uh, but only for you, for yourself. Uh, not like me. Uh, then they understand me and come with me. We are hand by hand go to Allah. This is my dream. Uh, and this is uh, what my students want from me, I think. So uh, they don't like the... Uh, world's happiness, they begin to like the other world's happiness. They help the people. For example, our students' children went every week, they are very little, and helped the ch poor children. And they are happy now. Before they want everything. This is not good, I don't eat that thing, I don't love it. But now they saw the poor people and very bad, in very bad situation. Every, every week they come to me and say, how lucky we are, how lucky we are. And we must uh, show the people only help the other people make the people happy, hmm. only. I want to show that because I try to do the same thing. And I love my students. I am the servant of my students, like what Prophet says to me. He said, I am the servant of my, uh, all the people in my life. I try to do that. So both of you are 
very deeply rooted in your own communities, very deeply grounded in your own traditions, and you also come, I think, regularly right. to the United States and, um, and life in the West in, in, in general. Um, what do you think is the teaching of your tradition that is most needed for people, particularly in the United States at this time? Mm -hmm. You're asking me? Yes. I feel like coming back to the original home and then make connection stable, that open, openness, uh, carefree, warmness, and then respect whatever happening outside world. And there's a dance between the, the carefreeness, openness, and seriousness outside. I should have a middle way of living. Too much everything is outside, it's not that healthy. Everything draw in, also not so healthy. Mm -hmm. So I think. Yeah. I love all kind of ways. I love Buddha very much. I love Hazrat Isa very much Christ. because Quran said to me, and uh, I believe that uh, I, if I show how I live and my students live together, mm. uh, it will be uh, good for all kinds of communities because we are happy. Mm. And we come, come this world to be happy. So we must show this. And, but uh, we need education. Because of this, I try to open some parts in university in North Carolina, in uh, Japan, Kyoto, in Peking. Now I have a dream in Korea, inshallah. Korea, right? You know, they come together because of, I, I think, our uh, un university. Uh, I believe that. And uh, we study very hard. Yeah. I am 65 years old, and I am 33 uh, kilo. But I am very happy, and I have full of energy. <laughs> and I believe that you can't find this energy with eating or with drinking. You find with en this energy with your love of Allah. And every day it goes more and more, and it makes me more happy. Uh, if one day I said to my students, if I will die, don't cry after me and say, she was so happy in the world, and we believe that she will be happy in the other world, inshallah. Well, we're um, almost uh, to the point where I'd like to um, invite our friends to uh, come with some questions. But before that, one of the things that I'd like to do, and particularly being mindful that we're approaching the, uh, the end of the, the festival very soon, um, is I'd like to know if you have a, a particular practice or a story that you think is something that people can take away with them and put in practice in their own life. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I asked. <laughs> they, they, have, they have enough. They have enough. And they have... Uh, you know, intelligent and make it their own package. Okay. They can make own package and you can go with that, I think. Okay. Okay. I have many stories, but I don't know which one I must tell. Uh, everything, many of them belong to Mesnevi. Hmm. Um, and I, we begin with the, how the world come. Uh, and there is a beautiful story in Mesnevi. And, uh, the Mesnevi uh, is Rumi's masterpiece of poetry. Competition. Uh, there is a competition between Turks and the Chinese people, and uh, they made a, a picture. 
on the wall. And uh, there is a third curtain, okay. curtain between them. And the Chinese people, unbelievable picture they made with beautiful colors, beautiful colors. Turkish people only uh, ho ho Polish? Polish? polish their uh, wall. wall. Polish, Polish, like us, to uh, finish the... Po polish. Polishing, polishing. Uh, to finish the bad habits, <laughs> all there from our body wall, they did this. At the end, the, the, the time came, you see it's uh, although not uh, real time, <laughs> but the time came, <laughs> and opened the uh, third curtain, and there is this picture, unbelievable beautiful, the Chinese uh, picture. Mm. But when it it reflects to the other wall like a mirror mm. and more beautiful, right. more beautiful. And uh, Mevlana says, this is the beauty of Allah. Mm. And when it reflects to the human beings, the real human beings, it will be more beautiful. Mm. So we need to right. be real men, inshallah. Yep. inshallah. Wonderful. Well, um, I think with that, what I'd like to do is I do believe that we have a couple of microphones set up, probably one over there somewhere and one over here somewhere. Um, here's the little invitation that, uh, that I have for the questions. Uh, and I always ask for the same um, instructions wherever I go. Uh, have your questions be like me, short and sweet, <laughs> right? Um, if it's more than a, if it takes more than a minute, it's not a question. It's a sermon, right? Sunday to church, go there for a sermon, right? Make sure it ends with a question for one of our esteemed friends. Uh, so I think I see one friend over there already. Please. Yes. This is for the Rinpoche. Could you please explain what is modern wisdom? I think it's not working. Hello? Yes. Uh, I think a lot of uh, discovered by very highly science scientists and it's very good for our you know, life improvement, long life, understanding of cosmology. There's so many beautiful things, and modern psychology. There's a lot of uh, great insight that I learn, uh, not from book, from my friends, students. It's very helpful for my understanding of Buddhism and teaching. So I think hygiene in Buddhism, hygiene is a little bit zero. There is con connotation, but you know, I learned my Buddhism in India. It's mostly all about next life, mm. and this life zero. But you can apply in this life, but the main aim is from to 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 free from samsara, not making samsara beautiful. Mm. But in the way, I think we should make samsara also beautiful but not as an ultimate way, because it's somewhere is also part of impermanent and emptiness. So this beauty of samsara and the understanding of its natural reality, emptiness and impermanent acceptance come together, I think we live quite healthy. Simple insight, complex outside, we respect the beautiful world from the simplicity. I don't know. I answer because I don't answer straightforward usually. <laughs> Thank you. I think there's a question there. This is a question for Rin Poche also. Um, so pleased to see the path you've given the young girls. 
and at the end of their education, whatever it might be, but especially those that go on for 18 years plus the three on right. retreat, you said right. they become mini Dalai Lamas. Right. Um, I'm curious about what the, ordin if there is an ordination process, what that is, who confers it, is right. it male to female, female to female, and besides returning to their village or becoming a teacher um, on an itinerant basis or at a certain place, do they have uh, a path towards being a leader like yourself? Thank you. Yeah, this one is ordination, one is education. So I, I have a full right and I want to do that. I can bring the highest form of education I can provide that. And as far as ordination, it's still a little bit debating between and from the Buddha and to women, it happens. And then some point, hello, some point we lost that lineage into it. So now uh, the <clears throat> the uh, Monastics are debating whether they uh, uh, renew or revive from men, or it has to have from woman to woman. And we try from China, we try from many other places, but it's not There's no clear uh, written, you know, lineage record from this female teach, uh, teacher and give to this and that. So, so still uh, debating. So we can go up to Koi Sudden, but the last Bhikshuni is still debating. And and we, many of us, we want to see that. And from themselves also. And His Holiness Dalai Lama also sort of favorable to that. But he cannot make that decision. Okay. So it's a, Vinaya is a little bit like democratic. Democracy? Cratic or crazy? <laughs> so. <laughs> but education-wise, Practice-wise, they can go up to all the way. And many of them, they go to village. Many of them, they might come to different part of the world. Many of them do service, social work, hopefully. Yeah. Thank you. So we've got about 30 seconds left. If there's a quick question, we'd love to welcome Ed. Hi. Um, so I study... Um, medieval literature, and I was reading about courtly love recently, like Arthurian romance, and I was fascinated by the fact, which I hadn't known before, that uh, much of that attitude towards women, towards like the veneration of women uh, at that time came from troubadour poetry in southern France and northern Spain, which came from Islamic tradition. Right. Um, and so that's where that kind of whole movement that we consider a, a Western cultural phenomenon came from. And I'm wondering if you could speak more to that, to women's uh, earlier roles um, being kind of venerated, both in romantic love and uh, simply as, as people in the Islamic world. Yes, um, so I'll just offer, in the interest of time, a very quick sort of answer. There's a wonderful book that I think you'll find interesting um, by Julie Scott Maysami um, called, I think, Persian Court Poetry. In brief, here's kind of what, what she says. There's a poetry genre that developed in regal courts. It was poetry that was done for kings and queens. And the, the main metaphor was kings and queens, then and now, were known as finicky, temperamental, 
moody, McDonald's eating, tweeting, um, <laughs> type of people who could be extraordinarily generous one minute and then turn on you and have you executed the next minute. So there was a genre of poetry where you would address the king as the beloved, but the beloved could also turn into a cruel beloved, a punishing beloved. What the mystics did was to take poetry that was developed in a court poetry context and reclaim it. So songs that initially were about dancing girls and intoxication and the cruel beloved being the king, and they recast it in a mystical direction. So they too start singing about intoxication, but it's the intoxication that doesn't come from the grape, but comes from the love of God. And they too talk about experiencing love and suffering on the path of love, but it's not from a moody king, but it's from the beloved who uses suffering as a way of cooking you, as a way of separating who's in it for love and who's in it for the goodies. Um, and so that's part of this tradition of S Sufi poetry, recasting court poetry, and some of that finding its way into the troubadour tradition, largely through Andalusia and, and other places. And I'd be happy to send you some references Thank later. Um, so I yeah. think with that and honoring yes. time. Yeah, so if you all could join me in uh, thanking our distinguished panel for an incredible session. Thank you.